Hello again, and thanks for watching our show. I'm Harry Greenberger. I'm the host for the show, and today we're doing something uh, different from what you may have seen in the past. We have three members of our organization who are also members of our board of directors, and uh, it was decided that each of them would pick a an atheist, either historic or contemporary, that they would like uh, to talk about. So what we're going to do today is we'll have an, an introduction of each of the three uh, atheists, and uh, then we will follow that with some discussion. So here to talk to us today are uh, Doug Stewart, Charlotte Claussen, and Lanny Goldfinch. Uh, thank you all for being here. And Doug, let's start with who you want to talk about. Uh, one of my intellectual heroes is uh, an atheist, Richard Dawkins. He's predominantly considered the number one atheist right now. Uh, he was born on 26th of March in 19, 1941 in Kenya, of all places. His father was a, a soldier in the British part of the British Empire. He moved back to England, to Oxford, uh, in, when he was eight years old. And, and he's a British citizen, as I am. Uh, I, was, I was actually born in a town called Swindon, which was 30 miles south of Oxford. So, but anyway, he uh, became an evolutionary biologist. His, uh, his claim to fame, his first claim to fame, was in 1976. He published a book called The Selfish Gene, which uh, predominantly had two major aspects to it. First, uh, from an evolutionary biology perspective, it, it focused on the gene-centered way of reproduction, rep as replicators. So everything, the reason everyone is here now is because our genes going back millions and millions of years have been successful. That's, that was the number one focus. Number two is he invented the, well, he, he proposed the hypothesis, I guess, of, of memes. Memes, he, he coined the word meme. A meme is like a gene, but a meme isn't something you can see. It's an idea or a a philosophy. That's M-E-M-E. M-E-M-E. -E. All right. And of course, examples of memes are like, you know, wearing a baseball cap backwards. You know, if, you, if someone sees someone wearing a baseball cap backwards, they may wear a baseball cap backwards. And, or I put my sunglasses in my shirt, and I didn't think of that, but I must have seen someone else do it, so I did it. So it's an idea that that replicates, just like a gene replicates. Copycats, yeah, like, copycats. like aping. aping and of course, the, big, the biggest mimet mimetic system there is, is religion. People, like for example, if Christianity died out today, it yeah. wouldn't re-emerge. Another religion would re-emerge and another person... You're saying they, they are doing it because yes. other peop they see other people do yes. it. All right. Like if, if someone was born on a desert island, even though they may... Th the chances of them adopting Christianity would be billions to one because they would, uh, Christianity would never evolve the same way it had before. So oh, I see. They but, may worship coconuts. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so that was his first claim to fame, and that got him into the, his foot into the religious door, or the anti-religious door, I guess. Uh, he published many books from then on. The, the most latest in uh, 2006 is... The God Delusion, which revolutionized my life. When I read it, I thought I could have written this book if only my IQ was about 50 points higher. But uh, it, it said everything that I knew, but in such a distinct, clear way. All right. Well, when we get around <coughs> to discussions, I have some information about the God Delusion. But, Charlotte, tell us uh, who you want to talk about. Uh, my atheist is Margaret Sanger, and her being an atheist is kind of uh, minor compared to what she did in terms of history. She was born in 1879 in Corning, New York, and died in 1966, and she is probably the reason we have the modern uh, uh, legal rights that women have uh, are still fighting for today. Uh, she, uh, in her lifetime, she was named one of Times Magazine's 100 Most Important People of the 20th Century, and that's huge considering that there are probably not that many women in the list. I didn't have mm. a chance to look. And that H.G. Wells had named her the Woman of the Century 
1966 when she died that when and he said that when the history of our civilization is written it will be a biological history and Margaret Sanger will be its heroine and I, I just had not realized that she had been so significant even though uh, ironically I'm the she chapter is. There she is, uh, the chapter uh, president of the National Organization mm-hmm. for Women, which came about after her uh, part of the swell of her her rights yeah, that well, she was fighting for. Well, you are very active uh, in in women's rights uh, mm-hmm. uh, issues, so yes. I can see why you why you selected this this particular person. Yes, go ahead. Um, well. As for, uh, incidental to uh, what she learned, uh, her experience with the Catholic Church and th- its influence over uh, the medical um, the medical field at the time of her growing up, she was in a, a Catholic household and uh, her watched her mother die and had, her mother had been pregnant 18 times in her life, which uh, because of the doctrine of that time that uh, w- uh, is completely unacceptable for women's health, and so it, it put her on a course that the things that she had uh, everything from coining uh, birth control, the phrase birth control. Uh, she uh, edited a, a newspaper called the, the Woman Rebel, which was uh, challenging the 1873 Comstock Act, classifying contraception as indecent articles and preventing dissemination of contraceptive information. So she, she took things on, you know, uh, head on, and uh, she faced time in prison, so she uh, went to um, uh, Europe. Uh, she uh, brought a lawsuit that finally overturned the Comstock Act. So uh, uh, issues such as uh, just talking about contraception was a was a huge battle that she you know had taken on. She was jailed eight times. She uh, brought diaphragms, uh, the contraceptive device diaphragms, to the United States and distributed to them, and uh, developed contraceptive jelly. Uh, she founded the American Birth Control League in 1942, which became uh, uh, Planned Parenthood that we uh, know today, uh, and. Um, there was a lawsuit, uh, which this, I, I guess, in terms of uh, so many women, depending on when we're born, take for granted the kinds of uh, progress we made, especially when we were too young to have experienced it or seen it. Uh, eight days shy of her 87th birthday in 1966, and only a few months after uh, Griswold v. Connecticut, which legalized birth control for married couples, um, in 1966, it took that long, even with her, you know, from the time she had started doing what she did, to, ha- to be able to have married couples be able to get contraception. Um, uh, that that's when it was legalized. So she got to at least live to the point where she knew that that had happened, and that unmarried couples, which I had not realized, couldn't legally use birth control until 1972. Let me just throw something in, then we'll get to, mm-hmm. to Lanny, but. Uh, after all of this success in making it legal for women to have the right to birth control, mm-hmm. today's newspaper has an article that says abortion pill approval condemned by the Vatican mm-hmm. because in Italy they just approved the RU whatever it is for the, uh, an abortion pill and the Vatican says that they will excommunicate a, a doctor who prescribes it and a woman who uses it. Mm-hmm. So after all of this advance, we are still in the dark That's ages. Right. That's right. We're still fighting it. And but I, I want to say, as my well, party, the <laughs> well, the, the, the world, the world. The, as my parting thought is, as I think that if this woman had not existed, we may not have made the strides that we've made in in the way that we made it. Of and course. so that's just a tremendous contribution that she made that was independent of being an atheist. Sure. Well, we're going so, to talk yeah. about all that after Lanny tells us about his oh, choice. Boy. Frederick Nietzsche. Let me read you something Frederick Nietzsche wrote, because Frederick, to call Frederick Nietzsche an atheist is rather an understatement because Frederick Nietzsche woke up one day and realized that God had died and he came up with the the idea that God is dead uh, 150 years ago or so roughly God is dead and marries his mother was one of the things he one of the, one of the statements he came up with Nietzsche was uh, not so much an atheist as he was an anti-religious person anti-Christian particular Christian person and one of the things that he says was that Christianity is a slave morality, he called it, and a social illness. He says it's the worst thing that ever happened to Western civilization. A derivative and resentful value which can only work by condemning others as evil. And you just gave an example here. Mm-hmm. 